Holly and Clooney here today. You know, when I look at her, I think, what a wonderful role model, because she was a teacher for a number of decades, maybe two decades, and then she took early retirement, and then she opened um, a creative writing school in, in Kildare. Yeah. And not alone that, she's obviously into um, further education. She went back to college. She did a master in literature, and that master in literature was on the Brontes. Mm -hmm. And out of that came this wonderful book, which is called Charlotte and Arthur, and it's on sale here tonight. I have to say, I envy that book because it tells the story of Charlotte and Arthur's their honeymoon. But when you open the first page, you're lying in bed with Charlotte the morning of her wedding day, and she's smelling the boiled ham, and she's wondering about the breakfast and she's going through the minutia of the day and you're immediately into her mindset and it's clear that she has read all the Bronte letters because you know there's that voice that carries through in the work so I'd be delighted if um, Pauline would come and say a few words please. Thank you very much um, for that introduction and um, do you do literary agency? <laughs> <laughs> My um, association with Maeve first of all is through a friend of ours um, who isn't here tonight James Scully in Banagher because when I was doing the research for Charlotte and Arthur and it, the, bu the book just follows the honeymoon it's a month in J July 1854 and um, so I knew I had to go to Banagher and the tricky thing about when I was doing the research was Covid happened in the, the middle of it all in that um, March but I still managed to get to Banagher there was a little window if you remember that summer and um, when we were allowed out and um, we, we went down to Banagher and I met James and one of the first persons James told me about was Maeve and he said you have to speak to Dr Maeve O'Regan if you do nothing else and at the time you Maeve had a, a presentation the 14 treasures of the Brontes and because it was Covid it was online and that was our first introduction we I think we spoke on the phone beforehand and then I saw the introduction which was absolutely wonderful and it gave me such heart that I wasn't a, a lone soldier uh, with regards trying to preserve the Bronte Irish connection um, so it, it was just wonderful for us to make that connection um, as well um, and then since then um, we were back in Banagher that was 2020 and then we were back in Banagher um, last year in 2022 for the That Beats Banagher festival uh, with James and other um, Bronte fans as well and I think you know what I'm realizing the more um, I hang out with Dr. Maeve O'Regan is that there is an enthusiasm for um, the Bronte Irish connection to be um, you know just put out there and, and preserved um, as well and I mean the genesis of my book was you know having done the endless on Charlotte Bronte and um, the, the genesis of it was that the Irish honeymoon and the Irish connection was only ever a line in the biographies or a paragraph. Even Gaskell's The Life of Charlotte Bronte gave it scant regard. Whereas the reality, and this reality we can glean from her letters, from Charlotte's letters, when she was on honeymoon in Ireland, is it was probably the happiest month of her life. It definitely changed her after that and as Maeve has um, alluded to you know the the brevity of the marriage it's such a shame because we I, I think we probably would have seen something um, with regards to the Irish connection from the pen of, of Cora Bell or Charlotte Bronte if she had lived beyond that because I think that she really did connect with Ireland in a way that her father always had. I mean, the few books that he had written, The Maid of Killarney um, being one of them, and he was very proud of his Irish connection. And again, that's glossed over because of the fact that he never came back to Ireland um, once he went over to England. But there were different times and it wouldn't have been that easy to... So Maeve has asked me to read a little bit from the book, but um, I think I'll open the exhibition before I do that. <laughs> so it's very important that I say that this wonderful exhibition of the Bronte legacy in Ireland is officially open. And I hope it gets lots of people to come um, and see 
this because it's you know what strikes me about the, the cross stitching and the involvement of made with the Banner crafting ladies is the collaborative nature of it because the Brontes were collaborative writers right from when they were children and their juvenilia to when they sat around the table and wrote together it was about collaboration so I think that the fact that this exhibition comes from a collaborative effort is wonderful as well and it's a wonderful legacy to the, the Bronte in general not just the Bronte Irish connection as well so well done Maeve and wish you the very best of luck with it thank you um, I'm going to read from chapter 16. So um, she she honeymooned a little bit in Wales before she got to Ireland, and then she stayed a few days in Dublin. With both of them, herself and Arthur, they stayed a few days in Dublin. I've written the book from Charlotte's point of view, and um, not her voice, it's third person, but from her point of view. Um, and most of the characters in the book are real. So they are the Aunt Harry, Harriet, who she went to, Mary Ann, um, and all the other Bells who lived in Cuba Court at the time. But I did take license with three characters, and one of them is a maid I invented, Minnie. She's features in this. So they've just arrived in Cuba Court in, in Banagher. Charlotte could see that they were approaching a stone pillared gateway, which had to be the entrance to a substantial estate, and she hoped that the carriage turned in. She was not disappointed. As it made its way up a tree-lined avenue, she wanted to lean out the window. Such was her curiosity to see the house, but a sense of pride and a throbbing headache kept her still. The carriage had no sooner come to a stop when the door was opened and across a gravel yard, a large square mansion dwarfed the welcoming party standing at the end of the steps. Charlotte was taken aback at the size of the house. She'd expected something much more modest. So this was where her husband had been reared and educated. She was unsure whether she should be impressed or annoyed. She had taken his origins to be of a much humbler bent. If this house was anything to go by, Arthur had quite the gentrified upbringing, and yet he never acted in a way that indicated privilege. Misinterpreting the perplexity in her expression, having let the others disembark, Arthur whispered in her ear, don't be put off by that block of stone we call Cuba Court. Its harsh masculine exterior belies the softness you'll find within. And then stepping out and extending his hand to help her, he continued aloud, Welcome, my dear Charlotte at Banner, and to what is for now your home. The following moments were a blur of introductions as servants, curtsies, and relatives shook her hand or, in the case of the ladies, squeezed her tight against their bosoms. <coughs> There were too many names to remember, and when finally she and Arthur reached Aunt Harriet, who was framed in the doorway at the top of the steps, Charlotte was sure she was going to faint. Goodness, Arthur, this little lady is not well. Thank the Lord I have the presence of mind to have a fire lit in your room. Quickly, follow me. And Harriet said and turned to go towards the ground floor room, which she had prepared as the bridal suite. But noticing that Charlotte was following, she quickly turned back. Arthur, come, come, tradition. Your wife must be carried over the threshold. Besides, this time a different <coughs> child. You've done quite enough walking, my dear, you poor thing. You're in a far more advanced state of ill health than Alan's letter indicated. How pale you look. We need to nurse you back to ruddiness. Arthur did as he was bid, and too weak to resist. As he swept her up into his arms, Charlotte lay her head on his shoulder, glad to be relieved of its heaviness. Many hours later, Charlotte woke in a confused state. She was reluctant to open her eyes, the reluctance of the guest waking in an unfamiliar bed. In her sleep, she had dreamt of warm fires and soothing drinks. She had heard soft female voices, their soothing sounds calming the pain in her head. There had been a scent of menthol, and intermittently, she had either imagined a soft, moist cloth bathing her brow, or some invisible hand had placed it there. As her awareness increased, a clicking reached her ears. She recognised it as the sound of knitting. As she listened, sleep was beginning to seductively take hold of her once more, and were it not for the sound of a familiar voice, she would have succumbed. Arthur was addressing the unknown knitter. Has she woken at all? He said. No, Master Arthur, nothing but twisting and turning. I think she has the fever. She was talking to herself, something about Flossie, whoever she is. Charlotte could not recall any dream that involved the spaniel back at home. How curious that she would call her name. She opened her eyes to see the owner of the voice, a young girl of maybe 16 or 17, perched in an easy chair, clacking needles as she spoke to Arthur. 
You have her nearly killed already. Mrs. Bell said it was all the trapes and you did around Dublin, that you should come straight here. She said that for all your learning, like the rest of the man, you haven't an ounce of sense. <laughs> I think I preferred you, Minnie, when you were a little girl following your mother around the kitchen, Arthur said to the girl, who folded her knitting into a basket by her side and leaving the chair went to a washstand where Charlotte watched her rinse a cloth in the basin of water and approach the bed. Arthur intercepted her approach. I'll take over now, Minnie, thank you. And Harriet has asked me to tell you that there are some errands down the town she needs you for. Christ, but there's always something, Minnie said, giving Arthur the cloth but continuing to the bed. Charlotte tried to sit up, but because of how tightly the bedclothes were tucked beneath the mattress, all she could move was her head, and because of its weight, she was unable to hold it off the pillow for long. Hello, Mrs. Nichols. My name is Minnie, and while you're here, I'm going to be your lady in waiting. Anything at all you need, just ask. As she spoke, it seemed to Charlotte that she was pushing the bedclothes further beneath the mattress, imprisoning her even further in a cell of cotton and damask. Minnie, out now, Arthur said. Okay. Well, I wonder if Los Hopkins is a great idea about, you know, the how sparky the writing is and how really, I think, you know, Pauline inhabits the character is really clearly and, you know, it's wonderful. So thank you.